Okay, we're live on Zoom and we'll just give attendees a moment to join and connect to the Zoom webinar before we get started and I introduce this afternoon's panel. I can see the attendees list uh, beginning to fill up now. Welcome everyone as you join us. Although Definitely Theatre have done a few of these over the past six months, it still all feels very new. Certainly to me as Definitely's producer, I'm used to being behind the scenes with our project manager Ian, who's running this afternoon's event which is much more my, <laughs> my comfort zone. Um, okay, fabulous. Great, okay. Um, well, it looks like we've got the first tranche of uh, attendees joined us. So um, I think we'll get started. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm Alex, I'm producer at Definitely Theatre and we're really pleased to have uh, three fantastic producers join us this afternoon to talk about their careers and all of the different kinds of work that's involved in being a theatre producer. So I'm delighted to welcome Matt Maltby, Deepa Shastri and Rachel Vesey to join us today for this producer panel. Welcome everyone. Before we tell you more about ourselves and our backgrounds, I'd like to introduce our interpreters for the event, uh, the wonderful Susan Booth and Cathy Yeoman who are interpreting and we also have Julie working behind the scenes to live caption this panel event for us. If you're joining us on YouTube and Facebook Live, the link's been tweeted to the Zoom so you can join that as well where you'll be able to see the live captions should you require them. So we've, we've split this event into two parts. We're going to begin with a 45 minute conversation discussing our experience as producers, talking about the process of delivering theatre productions and working with artists after which there'll be a 45 minute Q&A where we'll try and answer as many questions as possible from the audience so we can make this event as specific and useful to you as possible. You can use the Q&A function on Zoom to ask your questions throughout the event. So feel free, feel free to write any questions in there as we go and we'll answer them in the second half of the event. Um, there are no silly questions, uh, all questions are welcome. So please just pop them in um, as we go. And finally, just to remind everyone joining us, um, we can be seen, you can't. So don't worry about needing to pop to uh, get a cup of tea or anything like that during the events. Um, fab, okay, housekeeping out of the way. Let's get started. We'll begin by introducing ourselves and giving a brief overview of the sort of work that we've produced in the past and our current roles. Rachel, would you like to start us off? Okay, hello everybody. Thank you all for watching and thank you to Definitely Theatre to, for inviting me to be a part of this panel uh, this evening. Very happy to be here. My name is Rachel Vesey. This is my sign name, Rachel, and I am a qualified sign language interpreter and I am also a theatre maker and a producer. I work for a company called Deaf Explorer. We support deaf artists on a range of art projects, not just theatre, but dance, visual arts, all kinds of arts based work. And that's me. Thank you. Ah, Deepa. Hello, my name is Deepa Shastri. Um, many of you may know me as having worked for Stage Text for some time. Um, we provide captioning for the arts sector. So I worked um, with Stage Text and have become involved in producing due to my work being exposed to theatre and other areas. Uh, for many years, I have worked in a freelance capacity in parallel with uh, my Stage Text career. I work as a BSL consultant, an actress, a presenter. Uh, the work that I have produced back in 2012, I was an associate producer and I was responsible for 39 different commissions. So they were commissions in many different art forms, dance, visual art, theatre, music, poetry, a wide range, and I had to be responsible for looking after all of those commissions. In the same year, I was the associate producer for Liverpool's Dada Fest. Um, not the only producer, there was a team of us working on that event. 
and then later on um, I took a role as a presenter at the Science Museum and that led to other producing work. Um, I supported them to ensure that the BSL element of the new galleries was as it should be. And we delivered 50 different BSL videos. And I was responsible for looking after the whole process of recruiting BSL translators, making sure all of the shots and the visuals were right. It was a huge role. Um, and what else? Yes, the Greenwich and Docklands International Festival, GDIF. Um, that's a major festival in London in June. And I was asked to produce a video for that. And it was linked to a lullaby. And it was something that I had never done before. I had never produced a video. So I did it. And I think my highlight has been my most recent work, working with Matt Maltby. And that was with Baz Productions. And we worked on a production called The Process. And I was working on that just after I'd had my second baby. So that really was a highlight for me. Wonderful. That segues nicely onto Matt. Of course, I put myself on mute to start with, of course. Um, thank you, Alex and Deepa, and thank you definitely for having us all here. Um, so I'm Matt, I'm the producer at Payne's Plow. Um, Payne's Plow are an, a kind of national new writing company. We tour new writing uh, all around the country, both in our pop-up roundabout, which is, um, oh, I've just given Susan a really fun word to put roundabout. Um, which is our pop-up venue, which travels all around the country and you can put it together in a couple of days and it can be anywhere in the country. Um, and next year we'll be working on a show with Definitely, uh, which I'm not producing. Um, outside of that, before I was at Payne's Plow, um, I was at the Young Vic, where I was the general manager for a couple of months, um, filling in for someone's maternity leave. Um, and before that, I was an independent producer I set up my own company. We worked mainly with new writing um, and I've produced two shows that are told in both uh, spoken English and BSL. One of those was Midnight Movie um, at the Royal Court, which uh, featured Nadia Nadaraja, um, who was signing uh, and then uh, a hearing speaking actor alongside her. Um, and that was that had an amazing team of disabled artists, not just deaf artists, but it was um, directed by the incredible Rachel Bagshaw. Um, we had the wonderful Brian Duffy as our BSL consultant. Um, that was a, like a huge highlight for me. And then straight after that, um, I and Deepa produced the process together, uh, which was at the which was at the bunker and was again told in both BSL and spoken English and had a range of deaf and hearing artists on it and, and was really exciting. And that was the last thing I did before joining the Young Vic and then coming to Payne's Plough. Thanks, Matt. And uh, I'm Alex. I'm Definitely Theatre's producer. I've been working with the company for almost a year now, firstly as interim producer, and I've just joined them permanently uh, as, as their full time producer to um, produce their work. My career has um, spanned um, several art forms, I guess. I've worked in um, interactive theatre, I formed a theatre company at university and we um, took our, our project straight out of university um, to we, we started on the fringe with a with an interactive project at the Southern Playhouse and we were lucky enough to be picked up by the Barbican Centre and that show would like to meet was programmed at the Barbican the following year and off the back of that Non-Zero One had subsequently made productions for um, the, um, the Bush Theatre, a couple of festivals for the Science Museum we returned to the Barbican another couple of times. We made a show for the roof of the National Theatre. And with Non-Zero One, I was um, co-devising, writing, and producing all of the work because the six artists, we were producing the work that we made. That was my um, sort of part-time career in evenings and weekends. And during the day, I was working as a press assistant for the Royal Shakespeare Company for a year, then moved into administration and worked for Frantic Assembly as their administrator. 
before um, Non Zero One uh, took two of us on part time. And so I was lecturing drama and theatre at Royal Holloway University where I studied. So I taught um, devising on the undergraduate degree for a couple of years whilst working with Non Zero One and um, back in PR. Uh, this time with Kate Morley, who is uh, definitely theatre's brilliant publicist. I then um, left Non Zero One to move into commercial theatre. So I worked in the West End for three years as a production assistant to, um, pain, uh, to uh, Playful Productions. Uh, with Playful, I assisted on um, some uh, tours of plays that came into the West End and um, worked on opening a new musical, Kinky Boots in the West End, which was a lot of fun. Um, I then left Playful to pursue a um, freelance, um, independent producing career. And that's sort of been a mixture of um, working as interim producer for several theatres during sort of periods of change. Um, I was interim producer at the Bush Theatre and interim producer at Sheffield Theatres and producing my own work alongside that, which has primarily been um, small scale plays off West End on the London Fringe um, before um, joining Definitely. So my, my, my career sort of um, combines working as an artist, um, producing plays and musicals, um, working as a theatre publicist and as um, a producer in-house um, with companies too. Um, so, tie, like linking together all of our experience, we thought we'd talk next about what a producer does, a question that most of us, I'm sure, ask ourselves on a daily basis. So, what does a producer do and what kind of things uh, does the job involve? Matt, would you like to start us off? Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, so, I think lots of different people will think uh, that a producer is different things. Um, not just people who haven't been a producer, but even people who have been a producer will have a different idea of, of what that thing is. Um, for me, a producer is just someone who tries to make an event happen. And like, whatever your job is, however you're making, however you're doing that, it might be um, clearing the bins out suddenly uh, because you notice them overflowing in front of the show, or it might be making a budget. But all you do is you try to make an event happen. Um, a producer is normally, so I work in theatre mainly, so I'll talk mostly about being a theatre producer. Um, producer is normally someone who asks, like, what does this show need and how do I get it there? Um, and again, that, that can in our minds before we've been producers or seen any of it, feel like it's going to involve maths all the time. It can feel like being a producer is all about understanding money or understanding how to raise money or understanding how to write a budget. And I don't think that that's what a producer is. Um, doing budgets is the thing that I'm the worst at in my whole job. And I'm not really that great at raising money either. Um, and those were the reasons that I thought I couldn't be a producer because I a producer was someone who did both of those things and, and nothing else. Um, but normally the producer does um, a lot of the organizing of the team so they might decide who does various roles. They might be part of appointing the team. They might be part of trying to find a venue for the show um, and trying to persuade the venue to take that show on. Um, they might be the person who sets the team's culture and helps decide how people are gonna be treated. They might be the person who raises the money. They might be the person who writes the contracts for everybody. Um, and they might be a person, it might just be me, I might just be the producer, or they might be a whole company. And actually a lot of the time, they're probably a person who has a website that makes it look like they're a company. Now, very often, they're probably a person who, like it looks like there are about five or six people doing this job, and it's just one very busy person doing all of these jobs. Um, but a producer really is what you want it to be, I think. a producer is someone who tries to make an event happen and as long as you get there do it your way um and you find your way there is basically the best way i can think of to define it but i will i will let the others speak more wisely than me rachel would you like to come in next oh yes uh, i saw deepa's hand go up as well oh okay all right i'll, I'll go first um 
I really realized that I didn't in introduce myself terribly well earlier. Um, I didn't go into great depth, but to you, that doesn't matter. You'll learn about who I am uh, via this session, I'm, I'm sure. But what is a producer? Okay, um, you know, for me, I became a producer by accident. Absolutely. Um, I kind of think I've always wanted to be a producer and I've, I've always wanted to, using Matt's phrase, make events happen. Um, I should say that I live in Birmingham in the West Midlands and around 2013, I think it was, so about seven years ago, uh, I noticed that there were just so many incredible deaf artists in the West Midlands creating amazing artwork and they, they're kind of just working within the deaf community and they weren't really known or being seen. Their work was great, um, but the mainstream didn't know about them, had never seen them, had never been exposed to them. And I really realized that I wanted these deaf artists to get opportunities out into the mainstream and kind of wanted to, to bridge that gap. And I was working in Birmingham at the time. And I remember uh, meeting uh, a visual artist who was just uh, incredible, a lecturer involved in disability arts, uh, really kind of, uh, you know, fully aware of that sector. And I remember talking to this person um, and, you know, sort of said that there are just so many incredible deaf artists. There's such a wealth of talent there, but, you know, the mainstream doesn't know about them. They're not really in the mainstream that much. And this was back in 20, uh, 2013. And that, that gentleman was called Alan McLean. And he really, he agreed with me. Uh, and the two of us agreed to do a project together. Uh, we wanted to sort of really show the mainstream community, look, there are these incredible deaf artists out there. They need to get exposure. Uh, and that's how that led to us setting up Deaf Explorer as a company. But really our company has been a real slow learning curve. Um, and we've really realized that absolutely a producer can do such a range of things. You might see, you know, uh, an artist who've got the most incredible talent, they've got a vision, but you know, they, they need uh, someone there to support them, to be behind them. And I kind of feel like my responsibility as a producer is to find a person, whether they're deaf, whether they're hearing, whether they're disabled or whatever, and, and, and find whatever gaps there are, uh, finding the right person then to sort of, you know, fill those gaps and that person who can then support the deaf artist to create the work that they're going to create. So I kind of feel that a lot of my responsibility I suppose is kind of creating the team um, and bringing together a good team to ensure that deaf artists work is seen more in the mainstream. Awesome, Deepa. Um, I think there are two things from me. It's interesting um, what Matt mentioned earlier about fundraising and other aspects. I think many people think that you have to fundraise every time you're a producer. It really depends on those individual projects. It may be that the money is already sourced by the company you're working with. Um, they're sorting out their own contracts. So really, when we come in, half of the job is complete and we are responsible for doing the rest. It really is project dependent. Um, my second point, would be in regards to what Rachel was saying about bringing something to the forefront. And in order to do that, you need to have real passion about the project you're working on. Um, and one of the biggest things um, about producing is passion because like Matt was saying, the role of the producer is to make things happen. Um, a lot depends on you. So you have to deliver a number of things that make them possible, whether you're freelance or under a company, which, which is a different role. And it's a, a lot of hours. So the passion is what keeps you going. I think that's a major thing with producing. Yeah, I, th yeah, I completely agree. And everyone's touched upon the um, breadth of roles that a producer gets involved in and as 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 matt and in fact as, as everyone has said the um it really is about making stuff happen and the stuff that we make happens varies completely according to the different circumstances that we're working on so we could be talking about um an independent producer 
who is um, perhaps working on their own and comes up with an idea for a project, approaches a playwright and a director, and then begins to put up a team around them, a creative team and a cast, um, where they might be putting work on, say, on the fringe, or a producer might be working in a venue with a much bigger team around them already in place. The funding is already there. And they're working to an artistic director's vision to deliver a programmed play. Um, it varies according to whether you're working on musicals or site-specific work, cabaret, comedy with um, individual artists, or whether you're self-producing your work as an artist or as part of a theatre company that you're with. And I think, I imagine what we all enjoy about the, the um, role of a producer is that it is so varied. Is the, and I certainly find on every project that I work on, I'm doing completely different things. Lots of the skills that we, we'll all talk about um, as uh, the panel goes on, lots of the skills are the same, but how we apply them varies um, differently according to projects. Have I got that right? Yes, absolutely. Indeed, yes, yes for me too. Um, cool. Well, we all make we all make work for deaf audiences, and um, I wanted to touch upon what we've learned from producing shows that are for, a, for a deaf audience or have a deaf focus. Deepa, would you like to kick us off on that one? Uh, yes, I think the first thing is is to make sure that everybody has undergone some deaf awareness at all levels. It's making sure that the whole project runs smoothly right from the beginning, from that very first step. Because the level of deaf awareness will influence decisions throughout the process and will explain why we are making certain decisions. So that definitely helps. Particularly if, for example, we are a company that's visiting a venue, so we're not based in the venue, that venue may not have the knowledge of how to work with deaf companies and deaf productions. And it may be that the company itself is already very aware, but the, the place that we're visiting is not, you know, in terms of um, flashing lights for alerting emergencies. So it's about having those conversations and it's a huge responsibility to take that on. It's also about making sure that as a producer, all of the, the stories about deaf people are authentic, that those deaf people are being represented in the best way. So it may be that you have a story, but of course we don't have control over that story because it's the writer that wants to tell the story in the way that they want to tell it. But it is possible to have some input if you feel that something doesn't quite work, that is possible. Um, a lot of people call that creative producing, where they're able to have some input into the creative process. I'm just checking that I'm right on that. So you can influence an element of the creative process. Sometimes we can have influence on suggesting the right people to be involved, saying, oh, this person would be great for the project. Um, we can use our own networks to influence who's involved. And often a lot of those people are unaware that those artists exist. So a producer can help with identifying the most appropriate people. So for example, it may be that they need an assistant director, a dramaturg, um, a deaf dramaturg, other collaborators, costume designers. Um, and I'm slightly going off point here, but for example, within the media, they may wish to have a deaf camera person who would be perfect in knowing exactly the right framing for the shots. So it's those kinds of things that the producer can influence. Um, just some other things, marketing. Marketing to deaf audiences. That's a huge part of the role. Specifically, if it's a small company, um, the producer may have to take on the marketing as well. Um, for example, uh, Matt and I, when we worked on the process, we had to take on the marketing as part of our role. We did have another person who was able to take on responsibility for social media, et cetera, but we were really focusing on the specialist areas um, because the play was a deaf story and we wanted to 
make sure that that show was full every night with deaf people. Um, it had access, it had captions, it had integrated BSL, everything. So we wanted to make sure that that was full. That was really important to us. And it's an area that a lot of people struggle with, but working with Matt on that project, um, it worked really well. If a play involves deaf actors or a deaf storyline, not every story will be the same or every project will be the same. But as producers, we have the knowledge and experience that it can help to make that process as smooth as possible. So we can make the appropriate adjustments here and there that will smooth things along. One very interesting thing about both deaf productions and deaf audiences is the post-show discussions, which has become part of the norm now in any production. You need to consider the access perhaps bring in a deaf person to chair those discussions and make sure that you're focusing on the right topics within those discussions. And that's an added layer and it's also additional to the budget. I think generally companies are starting to consider access um, right at the beginning and it's becoming the norm. It's also good to engage with schools where there are uh, deaf cohorts because it's good for children to think about perhaps they wish to become an actor um, or they may wish to become a lighting operator and it's good for them to have role models and, and see those in action. I think I'm just let, letting me check if I've included everything I wanted to say. Just one thing that I've learnt, make sure you have contingencies within your budget for access because there will always be something that comes up that you haven't thought about. We're, we're still pushing those boundaries. If you're, We're not quite sure about exactly what we need in the budget. So it's always good to have something extra for something that you just never expected and prepared for. Rachel. And really to add to Deepa's point there, I mean, Deepa has uh, shared a lot of very valuable points, but uh, I think for me, what I wanted to, to add to this discussion is it's work that's so important to be led by deaf artists. And that's what's so important to me. And Deepa mentioned about stories being authentic and being from the lived experience of deaf people and really from deaf people. And I, I think that's vital, particularly now, I think, you know, in, in theatre, in the, in the general arts world as well, we really need to be encouraging deaf leadership. And I want, you know, the future people running, uh, you know, uh, art centres to be deaf people. Um, and I want them to programme work that's been created by deaf artists. And, and that is my huge aim. Uh, we're really trying to encourage the, the arts community to really understand that there is a wealth of deaf talent out there and we need to really support these people to become the deaf leaders and the deaf artist leaders of the future. And I think that's so vital. I think a lot of people hit that stumbling block where they think that they can't produce or they don't know how to produce. Uh, and I, I think a lot of you know, deaf artists can't get their work into arts venues, but I, I am hopeful that in the future that will change. And I am hopeful now that more deaf artists work is being shown in the, in the mainstream and they're getting more exposure and that's so important and, and when we do show that work out into the mainstream I think you know the mainstream arts communities realize that there is uh, those those barriers that, that deaf people face uh, and you know all that language oppression etc that deaf people have gone through that you know we we need to sort of shine a light on all facets of society and have everyone's work represented within the arts um, and for me producing work by deaf artists and creating work by the deaf community it has to be from a deaf environment and that's uh, that's always wonderful and and, and encouraging but when you go into a mainstream venue it can feel different um and i think you know uh, i think you need to have that understanding that you know i don't know the quality might be different your expectations might be different um 
and I use, you know, the word a lot, scaffolding. Uh, you know, you need that scaffolding under you. You need that strong base. Um, you need deaf artists feeling comfortable that they can then, you know, build the next layer uh, on top of that scaffolding block and, and up they go. And I think there is a bit of a gap there. Uh, and I really feel that we need to build that scaffolding so that deaf artists work can be shown in the mainstream. Yeah, and just to add to that, it's, it's brilliant to see that that is growing within the industry and within the within the main programming of venues. You know, the, the way that Ramps, of, Ramps on the Moon is growing with its tours and the impact of its work. Um, and venues commitments to the artists that are involved in that, Nadia Nadaraja returning to Leeds Playhouse this Christmas to be um, performing in their Christmas show. Um, Sheffield Theatre's programming Fingersmiths as part of the main programming, rather than just receiving it as a tour, it's one of their main um, three productions that they invest in. Um, and I think co-productions too, um, are really important and definitely theatre really be are really excited to be working with Payne's Plough next year uh, on a project to be announced so all of those are all really um, important steps to kind of to grow into the main programming of the venues and the main work that venues are doing rather than it being any add-ons or one-off um, captioning or signed performances um, and I think you know the, the, the groups such as um, we Shall Not Be Removed are making a real impact this year, certainly, in, in, getting, our vo in getting, our, getting voices heard um, of uh, deaf and disabled artists and making sure that it's brought into a kind of a policy level um, decision making for theatre organisations and uh, funding bodies around the country. Um, Matt, what did you learn from working with Deepa and from your work? Um, I mean, from working with Deeper, uh, enormous amounts, which I think I'll kind of cover throughout some of the different questions. Um, thinking about, so obviously I'm a I'm a hearing producer, trying to make work in in some cases last year uh, for large deaf audiences, and I can only echo what what Deeper and Rachel have already said that um, working with deaf artists, but also deaf members of the team, was really crucial for me. I think Deeper and I made much better decisions as a producing team and reached different audiences because we had each other. And I certainly would never have been able to reach some of the audiences that we got for the process um, without Deeper's expertise and experience and lived experience. We, I, I just, we wouldn't have got anywhere near there. And I think it's so important, not just to focus on deaf artists, but also that there are deaf producers out there um, because ultimately you're making a lot of the decisions um, and, on the back of a producer's decisions, the culture of a team can be set, but also the culture of a marketing campaign and the culture of who's gonna be there. Um, as a hearing producer in that context, it's really important to challenge your own assumptions constantly, um, to challenge the assumptions that you may have about your deaf audiences. Um, we all live in a world where we are socialized on a really daily basis by um, the people around us and by the media and being, like really vigilant with yourself about what you may be assuming about people whose experiences are different from yours is really important. Communicating clearly with your audiences in ways and places that work for them is really important no matter who you're marketing to. Um, it's particularly important if you're marketing in a language that is not your own first language. So if you're marketing in BSL, um, working out where you wanna be placing those adverts, where deaf people who are interested in theatre are actually going to pick up your adverts. I had a really interesting conversation this week uh, talking about a show that was not um, specifically focused at deaf audiences, but we have a very particular audience that we're looking to attract um, in an area that doesn't really engage with theatre very much and has been quite, quite culturally deprived. And we talked about what we had in place and someone in a really honest and upfront way went, that's all great. Like that's going to do really well with the audience that comes to our theatre every week the people that we're talking about will not care about or see any of the things that we've talked about today. And you've got to be able to have conversations that are that honest and that upfront about whether or not your audience is actually gonna engage. Um, I think one of my experiences in, in working with deaf audiences and in particular trying to reach deaf people who didn't come to the theater very often was that um, 
we had to earn trust and be humble because people are facing so many barriers to coming to the theater and have had so many bad experiences of coming to the theater before that uh, at times you have to work very hard to earn that trust and you have to accept that it won't always be given or it won't always be given easily and you just have to get on board with that um and i think deep has already touched on access from the start but access being integral to a show and as alex has said not simply being there for one show or being there for two shows um making really clear to everybody that this show is for you always. This show isn't just for you on a Saturday afternoon. This show is for you always. Um, and I think if you're interested in attracting a deaf audience um, or an audience that requires any kind of access language which hasn't already been part of mainstream theatre for the last hundred years, um, then you have to make that very clear uh, and be very open about the fact that you're prioritising people. Um, and don't be embarrassed or ashamed to prioritise people and make that clear. Um, yeah, I think those those are the big things I took from from those two shows. Amazing, thanks everyone. Um, I've got a, a few more questions for the panel before we move on to um, questions from the audience. Don't forget that you can use the Q and A function um, on the Zoom, so that the button for that should just be at the bottom of your screens, and you can drop questions into that, and we'll be coming to those in about ten minutes. So um, ask away and um, we'll get those answered. Um, so, big question, what kind of skills are required to be a producer? Rachel, do you want to kick us off on that? For me, the number one skill needed is patience. You must be a patient person, you must be open-minded, you must be ready to learn, uh, flexible, and for me, as a producer, I think most of the time I'm a, the troubleshooter, I'm the problem solver, um, you know, from the beginning to the end of a project, if any little problem comes up, I'm like, right, how can we solve this? What's the way around this? How can we resolve this? So I kind of feel that that's a big skill. Uh, and a, as a producer, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, not specifically an artist myself in a lot of projects, but I'm always creatively thinking of solutions to problems and finding ways around any issues that do transpire. You do have to be the budget person. Uh, you do have to be prepared to sort of put that budget together. Uh, however uh, that hard that is, uh, I have Discalcula, uh, so number inversions. So for me, when I look at a budget, numbers move on, this, on this, the screen and that, that is hard. And I have to find ways of uh, getting around that. You know, like for example, adding VAT uh, to people, you know, you might ask, you know, um, um, uh, you might ask for a quote for someone and then they give you the quote and you, then you think, oh, is it VAT on top or not? Uh, and that's a huge question I, I learned, you know, my first time producing, I forgot to ask about the VAT and suddenly got an invoice that was 20% uh, higher than I had envisaged. Um, so, you know, working out VAT on top, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's hard. You don't have to be great at maths, but maybe if you've got someone who can support you, who can have a look at the budget for you, if you kind of create it and then, you know, just give it to someone with a fresh eye, uh, an outside eye. And, and as I said before, I'm really lucky that I work as uh, part of a team. Uh, my colleague is, is dyslexic, so uh, he he's, wants support with English. Uh, I'm, I'm dyscalculia, so I want support with maths. So kind of we, we've got that skills exchange, if you like, and we're always supporting one another uh, with, the, with the areas that we need support in. And I think, you know, in a team is better. I mean, you can do it on your own, absolutely. But, you know, for me in, in Deaf Explorer, I'm very lucky that there's five members of the team who have very specific responsibilities and very individual roles, but I do have those people to fall back on. And I have those people to, uh, to support me. And, you know, you have to be prepared to do anything, you know, as a producer, sometime you're you know, doing the get in, doing the get out, painting a piece of set, designing a poster, sewing a costume. Um, you know, you have to be prepared to do anything and everything as a producer. And as Deepa mentioned before, the role of a creative producer is, I think, really important to sort of liaise with the artists, to get to what they're wanting to create. And I think I'm always available for, for my artists to ask questions, to be a sounding board, to have, you know, those private chats, those supportive chats, and then obviously back off and let them go and create their work. 
Brilliant. Deeper. Deeper, what, what skills do you think uh, um, would you like to add or require to be a producer? Um, a producer needs diplomacy, a lot of diplomacy, because you're the glue, essentially, that holds everything together. And Matt was mentioning about the culture of a company. It may be that the culture is already present, but you keep hold of that. You keep it um, gelled together. Um, and it's also ensuring that everyone has a good experience on the production. If there's any bad feeling, then that creates tension. Um, that's also very important. What you also need to be very good at is record keeping because things will just slip from your memory. There are so many things that you're juggling at the same time. It's so important to make a note of those things so that, that, so that you are able to cover everything that you need to do. So record keeping is vital, um, whether it's uh, the production meeting that you have to attend or some marketing information you have to provide and you're constantly checking, have I done this, have I done that? Um, and you're also responsible for the big picture that's also important because everybody is focusing on their own roles and the producer has to help to remind people, yes, you have your own roles, but this is our main mission. This is the bigger picture. And then people can often get slightly obsessed with, with the minor details. And it's about reminding people that we're getting there. Don't worry about those minor things. Um, you have to be incredibly hardworking because it's a really tough role. Um, that's not essentially a skill, but it's an important part of being a producer. Yes, I, I think that's it for me. A lot of admin too as well, uh, Rachel's just coming in there. Uh, just there's, you know, so much paperwork that you have to do before you actually physically get uh, anywhere into a venue. Yeah, these are brilliant. Matt, how about you? Um, I'd... I agree with everything that has been said so far, but I would also for a second uh, just disagree with it all and say that you don't need to have any particular skill to come in and be a producer. Rachel and I were talking earlier and both of us started by being accidental producers. Both of us started by producing very small things and learning on the job. And all that I think either of us wanted was to make something happen. And then we learned all of the other things. Um, I also think that producers, just like everyone has their own personality, everyone has their own producing style. And someone might tell you that the most important thing in being a producer is to be a really ruthless negotiator and be able to get like the best deals possible. But I might tell you that the most important thing in being a producer is to be patient and to be kind. Um, and I think no matter, I think it can be very easy to have an idea of what a producer is and go, oh, I don't measure up to that idea, so I shouldn't start. Um, I don't think you need to have any of that. I think good producers learn to be patient. They learn to be kind. They learn to be better with budgets. They learn to be good at diplomacy. Um, they learn to, as Deepa says, see the big picture and realize what's important because sometimes there's too much work to achieve everything. And so you have to decide to do one thing and let the other thing go. And, that's, and that has to be fine. And I think good producers also learn to be calm. Good producers learn when everyone's really stressed and it's, you know, the day before the show and it's, you're overrunning and the show is half an hour longer than you thought it was gonna be. And you've just been told that you can't do that thing that was really important because the theater thinks it will set the theater on fire. Um, a producer is just the person who sits everyone down and goes, oh, okay, I think it's gonna be fine. How are we gonna get through this? Um, but you'll learn all of that. You don't need any of that at the start and nobody has that at the start. Um, so I think all you have to do is, is to want to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, very much these are skills that we've all learned along the way. And um, I would add that um, a really important skill to being a producer is not being afraid to make a mistake because it's because the, as we've touched upon earlier, the role of the producer is so diverse. There are so many different types of being a producer, um, so many different things that we face on different productions that I've certainly been learning my whole career. 
and the way that I've be- the way that I've become a producer is through learning on the job really by doing something having a go often making a mistake and then next time doing it a little bit differently so I've I've certainly found that I've built um resilience um in this job which is a which is a great skill um that people develop as producers um and also not being afraid to ask a question is really important like i i come up against things that i don't know how to do all the time don't tell definitely theater but i ask a question when i don't know how to do something i i look to my network i um and and that um you know that's a really really important skill that's why hopefully you're here watching and that's why we're here to sort of share our experiences of being producers because um we want to share um what we've learned and i think that's one of the um one of the things that i most love about the theater community is that people are so willing to share their advice and so open to supporting emerging producers and creatives um because we were in that emerging starting position ourselves not so long ago um and so asking a question i think is it is the only for me is the only way to produce if i if a director says they want to do something on a production and i don't know how we can do it i look to the people in my creative team to solve the solve the problem with me or i look to um people that i've worked with to help me solve that problem deeper One area that I always feel slightly anxious about is making sure I understand the legal stuff, whether it's equity requirements or theatre tax relief. Um, There's a whole number of areas that a producer is responsible for. And Rachel was saying earlier that you went on a course, but many of the things that there were in the course that you mentioned were perhaps things that you learn on the job and you might already have been aware of things that I learned from Matt for example and you can ask people you can get support for the things that perhaps you don't know and need to know it's very different from other industries um, because we we can ask because the industry is very generous And one thing I liked particularly about Matt's producing style, he talked about kindness. Let me give you um, an occasion that happened in the production that I was involved in. One or two actors um, experienced an injury that happened during rehearsal. Thankfully, we had additional money in the budget, which made it possible to ensure that those actors could go for physio Um, And again, it was one of those surprises. We didn't expect it to happen. And and really, it's the attitude of the producer that made those actors feel supported. They felt safe. And then they loved that whole experience of being on that production. That was so amazing. It's, It's what makes that role so special. Rachel, and then we'll go to uh, our next question. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to respond to Deepa's point about the course. Uh, I should, I don't, the audience might think, what course? I realised we were talking about that before we actually went live. Um, I know that the, you know, there are uh, university courses that you can do in theatre producing, uh, and that's not what I did, I have to say, you know, as I say, I, I done my own projects for many years. Uh, For 15 years I led a youth theatre that was a mix of um, deaf and hearing people and and some that were just deaf people and just hearing people and you know I set up as well a lot of youth theatre projects uh, over the last 15 years. I think I set up nine, uh, nine different uh, youth theatres and it kind of became my responsibility just to set up a lot of youth theatres and run them and then hand it over to uh, someone to then sort of take the reins on. So um, that's kind of like producing I suppose and and learned a lot of skills there Um, and the course that I went on it was two years ago uh, and it was an evening course it was eight weeks, eight evenings, uh, you know three hours and, and so forth each time. And for me, that kind of, it wasn't, 
you know, as uh, I learned, yes, about theatre tax relief, that was the valuable takeaway, but a lot of things I'd learned, I'd learned on the job. I'd learned from producing and I'd learned from um, setting up all those youth uh, theatres. So for me, it wasn't particularly valuable, but I do think the network it gives you is valuable, yes, but it, I didn't develop my producing skills in that regard. But the course was wonderful, I have to say. It really was one, the content was wonderful. And uh, in 2021, they're running it again, um, you know, and it's free in 2021. I paid 500 pounds to do it. Um, so yes, yeah, you have to apply if people are interested. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm marketing their course. Uh, I don't know if that's allowed, definitely theater, but um, uh, it is an amazing course. Uh, it's run by a, a company called uh, China Plate. Uh, you know, um, China Plate, I don't know if you sign plate, but there we are, China Plate, they're based in the West Midlands. Uh, and next year they are doing a producer course. It's free, it's online. You do have to book a place, but they're very open-minded. They're very aware, they're very flexible. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, that they would welcome uh, any applicants who would be interested. Um, and, you know, for me, I suppose, uh, my own experience if you know if I'm a first-time producer or if I you know I'm unsure about anything or um, you know who to go to or if I am a bit panicked uh, you know I, I, I've gone to various theatre networking events uh, and you meet other people who've done similar things before and you sort of say oh I've got this issue can you help me and they're always oh well, yes I've done this let's do this or I know you should meet Bob, you should meet Tim, you should meet this person, you should meet Sandy, um, you know, and it's just, you can't believe how generous and warm and, and, and welcoming pe people are. And I think the network of theatre professionals is, is so valuable. And those skills and that experience that people were willing to pass on, is just incredible, you know, uh, you might want to say, oh, I've got this project, uh, can I use some space in your venue? You might get some space in kind. Um, and it's great. I think, you know, as people have been sharing that the theatre community in the UK is incredibly generous and supportive. So really do use that resource that's there. Absolutely. And I'm sure we'll touch upon some other training opportunities uh, and experiences when we come to everybody's questions. I'm, I'm aware of time. So I'd like to put one more um, important question to the panel before we move on to... Um, uh, audience questions. So I'd love us to quickly touch upon what what is it important to the producers bear in mind when working with deaf artists. And Deepa, I wanted to if you'd like to kick us off on that one. So a producer should be looking at a deaf actor and a hearing actor and thinking about what extra load is that deaf actor having to take on. Whatever that extra load is, the producer needs to consider how they can remove that from them. Secondly, if that extra load is something that we can give to someone else or it's something that they can only do themselves, we need to be paying them extra. So for example, if they're taking on a translation role or other areas of skill that they may have. Some actors may, in the course of the rehearsal, deliver deaf awareness, so we need to be paying them for that extra load that they're taking on. We also need to be crediting them for that extra work that they're doing. So saying this person was involved in translation or this person took responsibility for booking the interpreting team. Producers should be aware that the access is not there just for the deaf participants. The access is present for everyone. And really it's more for the non-deaf participants because often they can be in the minority if it's a majority deaf production. So it's them that needs the access. So don't expect access to work to cover all of the costs make sure that there, there is an element of access reflected in the budget for those hearing actors who need it. I think that's it from me. Ah, Matt. Oh, Rachel, was that your hand up? Rachel, to you. I'm oh, sorry to come jump in there. Just, I just wanted to add, you know, uh, being a producer is a hard job. And I think you can be tempted 
to you know put off hard conversations or hard contract negotiations that you might you know want to do but you're terrified of doing it but you know for me I find it if you are stuck if you're finding things hard yes get that support and yes get those conversations underway and out the way and I think sometimes when you start a task that you've been putting off it's actually all right it's better than you expected um, today I was creating a contract and it's something I've been putting off for quite a long time because it's a lot of it's complicated there's a lot of elements to it it's the VAT thing that I mentioned earlier all the different expenses and the amounts uh, are different you know uh, as they should be this person's quite high profile and I was like oh gosh who am I putting this together for them you know it really kind of really did rock my confidence and I'm like no, come on Rachel I can do this it's just a contract I've put contracts together before you know and then I, I sort of did it and I sent it you know and I sort of put this lovely email let me know if you agree with this or you disagree with this and they responded quite quickly and say oh just this tiny amendment to that word or this line and that was it and I just made that tiny little amendment and it was all agreed um and you know why did I procrastinate why did I put that task off um but I think sometimes you just kind of have to you know roll up your sleeves and actually get on with doing it so yes that's just something I wanted to add Absolutely. And Matt, what have you found it important to bear in mind when working with deaf artists? Um, I think there are, there are a couple of things. We've talked already about the importance of having deaf leadership in the producing team. Um, and you'll make better decisions for your team if you have a more diverse team making those decisions. That's true whether you're working with a deaf team or whether you're just working with any kind of team. Um, ensuring that the rehearsal room culture um, is one that embodies and, and includes deaf culture within it. And it's not just um, a hearing person's room that has some deaf people in it. Um, I think thinking about time when people are speaking in different languages is really important. So um, we, I think it's really important to allow more time for tech. If you've got a, deaf uh, a team that's made up of deaf and hearing members because everything just needs to be translated back and forth. And it may be that if you just had a deaf team, things would be a lot quicker, but that's the nature of the way that we're, that we're working. I think that's important. And I think having, we've talked a bit already about having contingency, some extra money in the budget, um, because you don't know what's gonna come up, particularly if you are working with people whose experiences are different from yours. It's very hard to predict what needs you haven't thought of um, the nature of having privilege uh, is that you don't know what you don't know. And so having some contingency, both in terms of time and in terms of money, um, to allow for the things that you haven't thought of yet, uh, I think uh, is also important. Absolutely. And I would, I would add that planning um, goes right into the uh, communications with the team as well. You know, communication by email, allowing time for turnaround, making good time to deliver the planning um, and clear and simple communications as well. I find that especially for me working um, with creatives um, where um, BSL is not my first language or in fact I don't speak BSL. Um, you know nobody likes massive emails at the best of times and um, I think it's, it's certainly teaching me to be really um, concise and efficient in the way that I'm working and the way that I'm communicating with the team. Deepa, did you have something to add? Uh, yes. Often um, a lot of producers may never have worked with a deaf team before and are not sure what people may want. The best thing to do is to ask. And also be careful not to pigeonhole deaf people into the same roles. It may be that a deaf person may wishes to speak or they want to take on a different role, but let them do that. Um, it's, don't always think, oh, it's a deaf person, therefore they can only do this, this and this. But that should always be agreed um, within the guidelines of the production. And if an employee is happy, then that's all you need. Great. Well, let's move on to questions um, from the audience as we've got half an hour to go. So we'll answer these as concisely uh, and as quickly as we can so that we can get through as many questions as we can. And um, we're hoping to do, um, definitely hoping to do a blog to get through questions that we weren't able to answer if we don't have time to do all of them tonight. 
Um, so the first question um, is from Bill, and it's how would you characterize the relationship between the producer and the director? Firstly, as you would most like it to be, and secondly, how you most commonly find it in practice. I know that Paula Garfield's watching this, so I'm gonna go over to Matt first to answer this question. Um, so I think it's really important that this is a collaboration um, and that these are always people who've got the same aim um, and are in kind of constant dialogue with each other. The worst version of a producer-director relationship is a director constantly saying, I want to do this thing kind of regardless of how much money it costs and the producer saying, no, we can't afford to do that thing. End of conversation, you can't have that. Good producers and directors go, these are the aims and how are we gonna achieve that together? And I think it's really important as a producer to always try and be in service of the show and of the creatives and go, okay, well, how can we make that happen? Rather than going, oh God, I don't have that money. But also to help a director understand what your parameters are and go, okay, well, if you want that, then maybe in order to afford it, we'd have to compromise on this slightly and we'd have to change that slightly. It's all about having an open conversation where both of you have as many of the facts as possible rather than keeping things closed. Absolutely. Deeper. Rachel, do you have anything to add in your experience? I think uh, the director has more of a creative uh, responsibility and the producer is more looking at budgets and legal issues. And I think each of them needs to respect those roles of the other. Um, I think that's a really important part, but I agree with Matt that it's interesting when we were walk working on the process. I love the fact that Matt would offer a plan A and plan B and suggest that. Um, he would never just say a straight no. He would say, okay, well, these are the options. Which would you prefer? And that, I think the director ultimately makes the final decision, but it was a very good relationship that I observed. Yeah, and I would add that communication, I think, is, re is really key. And a shared vision as well, starting off from at the very beginning of production, the, the whole, as the, as the creative team shakes up, everybody being uh, on board with the um, director's vision and what the whole team wants to deliver. And I think it's really important, I find it really important to make sure that the director really understands, um, and this usually is the case, um, but make sure the director really understands the parameters of a production, the scale of the production, the budget that you're working in, so that it, it's easier as you go along to trouble, troubleshoot and um, work out solutions for problems or ways to deliver uh, ideas that a creative team has had. Um, within the parameter, within the financial parameters of a budget. So, um, for me, um, the I think producers can get themselves into challenging situations when they're not sharing everything, when they're not um, sharing um, costs and what the budget is, um, because it makes it, it it can often back you into a corner um, when you're not able to achieve what um, what creative team wants to deliver. Yeah, I, I would just to add to that, um, I saw one of the questions in, in the q and is also about like insecurities and m a lot of I think my biggest problems as a producer have come from not wanting to seem vulnerable and not wanting to go, you know what, I don't think we can raise any more money or like, you know what, we're actually a bit short of the fundraising target because I found that really difficult at the moment. And as Alex says, when you're not sharing what problems there might be or what parameters there might be because you don't want to seem vulnerable um that's when you can cause problems and one of the big things that i'd say when you're starting out as a producer is don't be afraid to say i don't know the answer to that or don't be able to don't be afraid to share the kind of the the worries or the problems that you're facing because that can that can really cause problems in those relationships brilliant um so uh, the next question, um, a question for Deepa, um, is how did you step into the role as a producer and what made you want to become a producer and who inspires you? So many questions. Um, 
I think it just happened naturally. I I don't know. It, um, I realised that I like the flexibility of working as a producer. Um, I could do a lot of it by email. I could make things happen at the other end in the in the production, the show, the film. Um, that oh, it's it's it feels an amazing achievement when you've been involved in that process and you've encouraged and moved things forward to make it happen. It's, it, it gives you a huge reward. And in terms of inspiration, well, it have to be Matt for me. I mean, that's very silly. Thank <laughs> you. I can only say that Deepa inspires me every day. Awesome, thank you Deepa. Um, next question is, what routes do you think there are for deaf and hearing people who want to become producers? And is the route different depending if you are deaf or hearing, do you think? Rachel, would you like to answer that one? Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to answer that. But I think absolutely we need more deaf producers is the first thing I would say. There are not enough out there, I think, at the moment. And I feel, uh, you know, if I just touch on my own uh, company, Deaf Explorer, we have a lot of um, small projects at the moment, but that's not enough to employ someone full time. And that's a huge challenge. You know, there's we could give short projects to people or short bursts of work, but, um, you know, that's not a reliable income for someone. That's not sustainable. They couldn't live on that. And my aim really is to... Uh, get more projects to try and grow our projects so that therefore people could be able to have a, a livable income and do that job as a producer and, and manage their own, uh, their own lives. So I think that's probably what I would say. Uh, and touching on the sort of deaf hearing uh, differences, I suppose it's, I mean, yes, it is, I suppose, different, you know, because there are many barriers for deaf people out there, whether that's in arts, whether that's, you know, as, uh, a producer, it's finding people that could support you, maybe having shadowing opportunities. Um, and I feel that, you know, theatre now is becoming more inclusive. It's becoming more open minded. We have more deaf actors and deaf artists being involved in, in mainstream companies. And I think it's about being confident knocking on those doors of theatre companies, art centres, people that you admire, companies that you aspire to work with and ask for shadowing opportunities. You know, do you have a small project that I could work on? Can I sort of, you know, follow you around for a day, um, you know, and, and sort of learn from them? I appreciate, you know, who's going to pay for the interpreter uh, if that's, uh, you know, if a deaf person's going to shadow a person all day. Um, and there is obviously money available from the Arts Council that people can apply for, for those kind of support costs to get more deaf people into those leadership roles and those producing roles. And I think, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, university graduates that send up, set up their own companies and create their own work. Uh, and I think for deaf people, uh, and also deaf, not just deaf people who want to become producers, but deaf people who are artists, you know, maybe you're the one deaf student in a university course or the one deaf student on a course you know there's a lot of isolation and it's hard to sort of get that support network and that team behind you and I think you know this is my personal observation I suppose I should share of, of what the the differences are um and, you know and I think it can be easier for hearing producers to network to go to these networking events to talk to people to be introduced to be passed on and you know for deaf producer doesn't have an access to work budget to pay for an interpreter to go to a networking event. Yeah, you know, that's that's a huge barrier and that's a gap that we need to resolve. If I could add um, a lot of projects where you co-produce, it is a bonus because it may be sometimes I would write an email and I wasn't quite sure about the, the the representation English you know we don't have interpreters with us all the time so I would send that um, to my co-producer um, and just say can you run an eye over this I wasn't bothering them all the time you know as, as, as responsible for the marketing element I had to make sure the tone was right and the message was right and the reason I bring that up is a lot of deaf people will say oh there's so much writing involved I don't have very high quality of English so I couldn't be a producer um, 
and I will say, do you think logically? Do you have passion? Do you not mind working long hours? It's those things that are more important. Are you a team player? It, that, that's, that's fundamental. Don't worry about your quality of English. Matt, what's been your experience of seeing um, producers come into the industry and your experience of starting out? Uh, so if, for me, there have always been two relatively clear paths, uh, which are quite distinct. Um, one is making your own work and kind of being an independent producer. And that was how I started out. Um, so doing scratch nights and then eventually getting the confidence up to try and produce my own show and, and you know, put my first Arts Council application in to raise the money to produce that first that first kind of two week show. Um, it's harder to make a living that way. So you probably need to be working other jobs um, or be supported in some other way while you're doing that. It, it, like it's hard to pay yourself as a producer when you're doing like one night shows. And, and certainly I didn't earn a living as a producer for a very long time. And then the other, the other way is to apply for production assistant roles or assistant producer roles with established venues. And you might start by, you know, doing a day a week or you might jump straight into a five day a week position. Um, I think I'd say the thing that I say to anybody applying for any role in theatre, which is that it can feel in the industry because there are probably more people who want to be involved in theatre than there are paid jobs for at the moment. Um, like you're really lucky to be taken on or you're lucky to get an interview or something like that. And it can feel like um, someone's doing you a favour. You're an asset. You're a huge asset. If you have any of the things that Deepa or Rachel or Alex have been talking about, if you have any of those qualities, you're a huge asset. And the industry needs more deaf producers. The industry needs more producers. There are always people looking for producers. Like even before I was a particularly good producer, I would get asked to do so many shows and far more shows than I had the time to time for because there are so many more artists than producers. Um, and the second that you have any experience people are lucky to have you on their books, whether that is in a paid role or whether that's shadowing. So go into all of those avenues, whichever one you, you take, knowing that people are lucky to have you and that the industry will be really lucky to have you. Um, yeah. And I don't think people should be afraid either of um, working, as Matt's touched upon, working, or, uh, working in other jobs as they're getting producing experience whether it be assisting or starting out themselves. And in my experience, when I speak to producers and ask them what their, what their background is, or what they've done before, people come from so many different backgrounds, have so many different experiences, whether they've come from a completely different industry or um, whether they have worked in different areas of theatre, such as press or marketing. And you will find that when you start out as a producer, your previous experiences really inform what you do. Um, and you can use that to complement different teams or working in co-production with other producers, for sure. Matt? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that um, a very good friend of mine, um, when we left university together, he was just getting any job that he could to work in theatre and be earning any kind of living. So he spent a bit of time working as an assistant to a literary, uh, literary agent and he spent a little bit of time working in the marketing department for the Globe, making videos for their en education. Um, and then he did a bit of, a bit of absolutely everything. He's now the executive director at Theatre Delhi. He was the executive director at The Bunker. And because, uh, he was a production manager, for instance, like he, he was an assistant carpenter because he has all of those skills and he has all of that experience. And all he was trying to do was get by. He understands so many different roles and how to work with so many different people. And at the time, what I saw was just someone who didn't really know what they wanted. But actually, all the time he was like, I just want to work and I just want to learn. And he wasn't worried that after five years, he hadn't got somewhere that looked impressive to his parents or he hadn't got somewhere that looked impressive to anybody else. He was just learning. And like, as Alex says, those other jobs that you're doing, even if they're not in theater, like I worked for a PR company as an assistant for a while, I was just gaining skills and I just got better and better. And then eventually when I had the experience and an opportunity came, I, I was more ready for it. Um, so yeah, there can be a lot of embarrassment um, in this industry about not earning a living from the job that you're doing. Um, I'm 31 and I think I, I first earned a living only from theater last year. 
um and it like it can it can be a long grind and that can make it not the right thing for some people but the last thing that you should be is embarrassed about not making a living from it and we have a oh rachel Um, if I could just add as well, I mean, touching on Deaf Explorer, we're a, a really small company. As I mentioned, there's five of us uh, in the core team. Uh, and really, we started just being two of us. Um, and, you know, we've we've grown and we've expen expanded and, you know, we, we worked voluntarily at the beginning. Um, you know, I mean, uh, obviously, I appreciate, you know, in a, in a COVID pandemic year, so many projects have been cancelled or postponed, put on hold. But this year has given us a, a time of reflection, I suppose, to really kind of, um, you know, think about what we want to do. You know, I mean, I was part time interpreting, really voluntarily running Deaf Explorer before um, and, you know, doing hundreds of hours voluntarily. And now with the COVID pandemic, you know, we've, we've um, been fortunate to get some core funding and we've got you know the time and space to do that but it's been seven years of slog to get where we are today and, and working in that voluntarily um, really and I really you know I have struggled with the art world you know because there is a lot of expectation that you would do stuff voluntarily before you get paid and you know you know Matt um, mentioned earlier about you know, doing many different roles in theatre, his, his colleague, that's great, um, you know, and, and great for him, but it's a huge issue for me for deaf people. Deaf people trying to follow that model is gonna, they're gonna come up with a huge barrier. Um, and so I kind of feel that there's a systemic problem that we need to overcome in the theatre industry as a whole that we're not gonna solve. Um, but, you know, whether a deaf person could get that same experience at the moment, I, I feel unfortunately that there are too many barriers in place for that to uh, occur in arts organizations um, you know we really need to lobby arts organizations to be more open-minded and provide more opportunities and it is still an issue you know I mean last year I worked with one company who were incredibly open-minded who really wanted to you know uh, encourage more deaf artists in there they wanted to welcome deaf professional actors but at the same time you know they they wouldn't give uh, an assistant director role to a deaf person uh, you know, they kind of felt that they, that they, well, how are we going to justify the interpreting costs? And it's, it's a, it's a huge issue that you, you do face and you do come up with time and again. One thing um, I wanted to add in regards to being an associate producer on the process, it was interesting because I was involved as a BSL consultant originally, then I was pregnant and about to give birth and I thought, okay, how am I going to attend rehearsals with a newborn baby? So I had a discussion with the director and I said, I want more producer experience. So she suggested I met other producers. Having met other producers, I felt it was something I was interested in. And her response was, okay, what about the BSL consultancy? Well, I've done that a lot, but I, it's very rare that I've done producing and there aren't many deaf producers. So I met Matt and asked him if he would be interested in co-producing and he said yes. And the rest is history. That's how it happened. I think you have to be brave. You have to raise and inform people of your aspirations. And if they don't know, once they do, then they'll do everything in their power to make it make it happen for you so it is about being brave amazing well on that note and matt um touched upon this earlier i think it's a, a really good time um to go into caris caris question about whether we've had to overcome feelings of insecurity in our producing roles and if so how did we do it rachel you're shaking your head would you like to answer that one first Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think if you are passionate about something and you want to make it happen, you are a producer. Uh, even if it's a small event that you're setting up to run voluntarily, it's a community event, it's a one day thing, whatever, you are producing that event. You are therefore a producer. Um, and I think, you know, uh, 
as we've talked about, the producing role has a range of skills within it. It can be a, a wide variety uh, in, in the job. And I, I always try and support uh, new producers about, you know, problem solving, being open-minded, compromise. And I think if you can be open-minded and, and have discussions calmly and diplomatically, uh, and if you're all working to the same aim, that same creative goal, then absolutely you can overcome any securities, insecurities and you can produce. Absolutely, Matt, how about you? Um, I have these feelings all the time. Uh, I have never produced a project which at some point I didn't go, I don't know if I can do this. Um, there are some things which in particular are like regular so sources of anxiety for me. So like very often before writing the budget for something or writing a contract where I know that there might be quite high consequences of getting something wrong. Um, often when I make a mistake, I have this horrible sinking feeling and I realize I'm going to have to tell the rest of the team about it. And I think, oh God, my artistic director is going to think they've made a terrible mistake in hiring me. Um, and I don't know if those feelings ever go away. Um, I think part of it is like, if I'm honest, uh, producing is difficult because it's very rare that you have a formal training in it. And as an actor, I was an actor before as a producer and I'd been to drama school and I knew what good acting felt like and I knew what bad acting felt like. And I knew that I mainly acted well. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm fairly good. And I think there are some things that I'm not so good at. I think also because the role of the producer is so broad, you can't be good at everything. And so there'll probably always be a thing that you're really scared of doing, whether it's budgets for me or whether it's, you know, something else for somebody, somebody else. Um, and I think one, um, learning to cope with mistakes is really important and learning to be open about those mistakes. Um, learning to be curious about your mistakes and going like, oh, that's interesting. I've just really massively screwed up. What can that teach me? And that is much easier said than done. Um, and sometimes just like putting your laptop down, going and talking to someone you love, like having a drink, calling your mum, whatever it is, like sometimes like it's a hard job and it just feels it feels crap like with many jobs like sometimes there are just really difficult scary moments and sometimes it's easy to be brave and go oh I made a mistake and sometimes you want to sit and be sad for a day but like you'll make mistakes and you'll get better at dealing with them and I, I, I feel the same I, I feel insecure all the time as well and I think it's something to do with the word producer that makes that that adds this as this level of insecurity where you feel like you should be in control the whole time. And because you're so, because you're responsible for production, you feel like everyone is looking to you to um, either make, make the right decision. Um, I think the worst, the worst advice I received at one point from a producer was that um, a producer always needs to be right. And that has terrified me for most of my career because, um, yeah, because I, I feel like I can't make a mistake when of course we all make, everyone makes mistakes in every job in their personal life all the time. That's how we learn. Learning is making mistakes, right? Um, and I thought that when I was working for organizations, as I was, as I was kind of like graduating from university and going through several jobs, um, I was, I was really nervous about making mistakes because um, at times I was worried about, like Matt said, having to talk to an executive producer or talk to an artistic director and talk about a mistake I've made. And I thought when I'm an independent producer, I won't have that worry anymore because, you know, um, I'll be in charge. And now I'm, a, I'm also an independent producer. I'm still terrified and I have to have a weekly meeting with myself. And... Uh, it's 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 bizarre so i think i might yeah my advice on that is just to um you know just to let go and accept that we all make mistakes and we're working collaboratively you're working with collabor collaboratively collaboratively with a creative team to get a show on uh, and it's a it's a group effort deeper do you have anything to add on that after my garbled insecurity rant mm, no i think um Rachel has covered everything. Perhaps back to Rachel. I just I wanted just to add a small contribution uh, about a producer really needs to listen 
and be a good listener. And, you know, sometimes a person is, is telling you something and internally you might disagree with it. And then later on you reflect on it and may think, okay, well, maybe that's not what I thought they meant. Or maybe that's linked to their access. Or maybe it has many layers underneath what they are actually trying to tell you. So I think as a, as a producer, you kind of need to uh, unpick what's being shared with you and, and, and really take time to reflect before you respond. That's just what I'd like to add. Brilliant. Well, we've got four minutes to go. So I'm going to put one more question uh, to the panel, which is that a lot of theatre makers want to break into mainstream theatre, but they don't have any luck finding a producer who's willing to work with them. Um, many deaf producers, many deaf theatre makers need help with funding applications, for example. So um, I wondered if you had any advice to um, those theatre to theatre makers like that or independent artists. Who'd like to um, start on that question? Uh, I'm happy to. Yeah, Rachel. Well, I can say that at the moment, I believe if you have an idea or a concept, it's the good time for you to apply to the Arts Council for a grant of up to £15,000 to make that work. I think sometimes people do come to me and say I want to apply for funding and it is hard to get funding, it is competitive, you need to sort of prove that you've done work previously, show your kind of track record, how you show your artistic practice, show your evidence, have budgets imbibed and, and you need do you need some experience before you apply for that funding? But I do feel that a lot of deaf people are creating work. Um, potentially it's, you know, um, evenings, weekends, you might pay yourself to, to, you know, to create the space and show it yourself. And, and then once you've got that experience, you can then apply for funding. And I think, you know, it can be challenging as a, as a deaf artist because there's the additional needs there that you, you need support in applying for funding and, and, and that support does cost money. So it is a bit of a cycle I appreciate. But I think at the moment, if you do have that creative vision and you have a, a concept, you know, try uh, bring in a team and it's a good time I think to apply for uh, smaller budgets for grants for the arts uh, from the Arts Council and, and just make sure you talk to people, get advice on how to do that tips on filling in uh, application forms uh, you know try it out show it to someone ask for their feedback um, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you know absolutely you can uh, achieve what you'd like to achieve could could you can ask for recommendations um, you can ask people who would you recommend for this particular help and eventually you will find somebody who wants to support your project. I think one area, maybe I'm making assumptions, is that deaf people don't often ask and we need to do more of that. We need to be getting out there and asking. Brilliant. And Matt, do you have any advice? Uh yeah, so I, I think a couple of things. Uh, there are some lists or groups of producers that you can go out to and ask and post your projects about. So there's a big Facebook group called UK Theatre Producers. Um, and actually, if you're just looking for a wide range of producers and you want to put your project up on the wall and go, is anyone interested in supporting this? There are groups like this that exist and, and there are some slightly more tailored groups for both deaf and for disabled artists and deaf and disabled producers that you can find either on Facebook or, or on Twitter. Um, there are a couple of producers. Um, Daisy Hale curated a list of um, independent producers working in the UK. That was a year ago. It might be slightly different now, but you can look uh, them up on Twitter and ask them for, um, for that list. Uh, and if you are taking the route of applying for the funding yourself, which you could either do in order to kind of self-produce the first bit of the project, or you could raise the money through that Arts Council bid uh, and then advertise for a producer. And I would imagine you would find one fairly quickly if you had guaranteed paid money behind it. Um, if you are applying for an Arts Council under 15K, under 15,000 application, um, the Arts Council, I think, I think I've got this right, someone may correct me, um, will give you a support, uh, an access worker to meet your access needs in putting together that application. 
And also um, the 15,000 pounds that you can apply for doesn't have to include your access costs on the project, the personal access costs for the lead artists. Um, so there can be a further 5,000. So that can be up to 20,000 um, if 5,000 of those are, are for access costs. So I would say, if you can look for some advice on putting together an Arts Council application and you can get just a little bit of support from an experienced producer in doing that um, and apply for the costs of a producer. Um, and if the Arts Council give you, let's say a thousand pounds for a producer to produce your R&D and you put that up on UK theatre producers, you will get some applicants pretty quickly. Now you'll have to sift through them and many of them may not have experience of, for instance, working with deaf artists and you'd have to, I think, work quite hard to decide who. Um, but that, I think, is probably the, the route that I would take. Brilliant. And just to, um, as I mentioned earlier, I would, I would absolutely add, or, and as Deepa said, don't be afraid to ask people questions. I can guarantee that the four of us have not got through our career without asking questions along the way and asking people for advice. And um, I would also look to other artists who have gone ahead of you, like deaf and hearing, that make... Uh, work similar to what you're interested in, look at the sort of places where they've applied for funding, look at the places they've toured or taken their work that you might approach, and lots of that information about the work that they other artists have done is on their website, which is a great place to start. And there are um, opportunities, uh, like as Rachel mentioned, and there was a question on this, um, uh, the China Plate course, so look up China Plate's website, um for their training opportunity and um there are opportunities um in the west end too there there's an organization called stage one and stage one supports emerging commercial producers independent producers who want to produce their work um uh, on their own rather than as part of a company or subsidized by the arts council and they run a fantastic bridge the gap program and that bridge the gap opportunity is to get people who wouldn't normally work in um, a commercial theatre, you know, people who look and sound like me, um, getting other people into the uh, industry. Um, so that's something else really worth looking up, bridge the gap. Um, and uh, Rachel, one final point before we're out of time. And just to also uh, add, I've put the link to China Plate in the chat function, uh, but also Deaf Explorer, we are uh, very open as an organization as well. And we want to support deaf artists. Um, you know, we have that support, you know, so people who are, they are out there. And if you need a little bit of a support, please do um, get in touch, uh, you know, please do contact Deaf Explorer to, to get that support. Uh, because you know uh, we are sometimes you know you need that additional support I mean yes uh, it, producing is is hard uh, but we want to support uh, deaf artists as well to become the producers that we need uh, you know we can't you know make a magic wand and and we're going to get you know a load of deaf producers tomorrow um, we need to give people the opportunities but we are open to talk and sharing our experience and we're not hiding please do have a look at our website and please do get in touch uh, if we can support amazing thanks Rachel um, well I'm so sorry that we've not been able to answer everyone's questions and we're out of time I can't quite believe how quickly uh, this hour and a half has flown past uh, but we'll try to follow up with a blog post on the definitely theatre website answering uh, outstanding questions to make sure that everyone's been covered this uh, talk will continue to exist on YouTube as well, so you can refer back to it if you'd like to. Um, at the end of this webinar in a moment, a survey will pop up on screen that would love you to take a couple of minutes to fill out. So that will appear as you leave the webinar. It's not very long and the information is so helpful to us as we're always looking on ways to improve our digital offering here at Definitely. Um, I'd really like to thank Deepa, Rachel and Matt for the fantastic discussion and giving up their time this evening to um, share that with us, share their experiences today. Um, also to Susie, Kathy and Julie for the interpreting and captioning. Thunderous a round of applause uh, to all of you. So thank you very much. And finally, thank you all for joining this afternoon. We really hope that you've got a lot out of it. 
please join Definitely Theatre's mailing list to keep up to date with all of our latest events. And um, we'll see you soon, or you'll see us soon, I hope. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.